As you know, we go back and forth, Old New Testament, and there was a good decision. Barry, you were saying it was about five years? We Is that about how long we've been doing it, these? <coughs> because um, it, it was a good decision to alternate old and new. Right? That really helps keep the flavor going. So uh, the next three in the Old Testament are going to be Nehemiah chapters 4 and 5 and 6. And they, they go together as a unit, as you're about to see. There's an um, amazing amount of uh, convergence, and it relates to issues you are going to be encountering. I know I'm encountering opposition opposition to your endeavors spiritual warfare is what this is about and the more serious you get the more you can be assured that you're going to make yourself a, a target for spiritual warfare it's when people aren't that serious that the enemy then doesn't need to bother with them they, they're, they're perfectly fine let them go as they are they're not affecting anything but when you get very serious about the lordship of christ about uh, discipleship about uh, conveying this good news, about getting off the dime and actually making it real in the marketplace. That's when things begin to be a problem and you begin to be noticed. How do you deal with opposition? <clears throat> and I think these three chapters, four, five, and six, as we'll see over the next several weeks, provide an answer for that opposition that we're encountering. And so I'm very pleased about this because it's so relevant to my time, what I'm, I'm, I myself am going through, that it's speaking to me as well. And by, by that same token, I think we're all going to be seeing a, an increase as we find ourselves in a culture that's becoming increasingly mad, crazy, amplifications of things that have never been seen uh, before in a world in which we see... Uh, unprecedented phenomena. I won't go into details, but I've told you this, about this before. Accelerating cultural diminishment. And that due to a collection of mutually reinforcing strands that are being woven together. And I, was, I had just gone through again the book of Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun. And it was so, but now there is something new under the sun. Uh, these are things that are unprecedented and um, unforeseen and could not have been anticipated. Um, so that you already had a diminishment because of uh, various other factors, but they're being amplified in a perfect storm. I won't go into detail, but um, a diminished collective capacity for rational and evidential processing. People, let, let alone common sense. People are less and less using their minds in terms of reason and less uh, in terms of evidence. So reason and empiricism are being lost. What's it being replaced by? By feeling, by the emotion, by the autonomous self, by my what I decide to be, so that our ideologies now, these ideologies, they trump biology. They trump all common sense. And people are afraid to speak, speak otherwise of it because of other factors that are also at work. Without going again into detail, perfect storm, postmodernity, which an identity politics which leads to the victimization mindset and so forth that we see becoming evident supernatural warfares that are going on with regard to israel that things that are beyond imagination that uh, that conclusions are being made mediaization into cultural imbecility you see i was just um jonathan height i was just uh, hearing an interview with him he's got a book coming out that's discussing this but um up until 2012 it was there were the normal processes. Um, it, you still had children would be playing with one another, to be doing things. But it was in 2012 that the smartphone came into being, and with that we went into a personal into a phone culture, and people were lost. And it's been the suicides and the other effects that have 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 been so absolutely unprecedented in human history. This is a new thing because. They're no longer being socialized and so forth. So this, this smartphone technologies, which can be used for great ill, but can be used for great good as well. And it's indeed my plan to use the um, technology of the second tower of Babel for, to uh, basically plunder the Egyptians and use their own technology to bring us back into an analog world for those who have the eyes to see. But nevertheless, the majority are going to be using these ways. Well, so this is, the, the diminishments have been profound. Um, and then an immersion uh, through AI and dark, doubtful digital spaces. Um, if it's a powerful thing, 
when people have lost a moral consensus as we have, then you have a volatile combination of increased um, moral imbecility with technological prowess and power. Very volatile when you put power into the hands of moral idiots. You see, that's what you've got in our world. Um, the vapidity of social media, posing and preening and posturing and positioning, all this false self stuff. And that's led to what I call a collective autism, where people are not even able to look at you in the eye anymore. They, they are not capable of having direct con contacts as much as they're becoming more accustomed to this artificial re relationships which don't exist. Um, and uh, apathy, amnesia, and anger. Uh, degeneration of culture carriers, globalism as a mandate, and the redefinition of sex, sexuality and the loss of boundaries. And I could wring my hands in despair if I did not know that this is all part of a purpose, is that God has a purpose in our lives, that he has a purpose for us that actually will, under, where, we, where we understand these are the times of the signs. Not, we're not just in the signs of the times, we're in the times, of, in my view. In my view, there's not much time left. And so, if anything, how do I respond? You've heard me say, instead of cursing the darkness and wringing my hands in despair, what I do is I focus on the gospel of authority, of truth, of its uniqueness, and see how it stands out like a diamond against a, a black background, you see. That's, and and the, it's offset. The beauty, the contrast of the gospel and the truth is so radical. This is why I find myself listening to these things more and more. I'm up to Isaiah, right? I'm late in Isaiah now, in my little, my, my little weekly report. I started in Halloween, my second time through the scriptures. It's astonishing. You guys can do it. I'm using the U version, any, any audio Bible. Give it a week. Try it out. What have you got to lose? Oh my gosh, I might miss the news. <laughs> Whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is honorable, whatever is pure, whatever is of excellence, if there is anything excellent and worthy of praise, dwell on these things. That is precisely 100% diametrically opposed to the news. It's not about what's true, it's what's false. What, instead of what's excellent, it's, it's shoddy. It's every, it focuses. What are you setting your mind on? And you need to ask yourself, why am I here? In this, and I'm in this warfare for a reason. And God's pl placed you, every one of you here, and he's contextualized you in an arena of influence for his purposes. And your work, your marketplace ministry is what we're dealing with here. Ministry in the marketplace means that you see there's no sacred, sacred, secular dichotomy, but the more serious you get about your faith, the more opposition you're going to encounter. And that's what we're going to be exploring as we look at this text. Uh, just to contextualize it a bit more, though, again, just going back to the theme and purpose of this book. So understanding our times, knowing how we ought to live is very critical. We need to understand our times. I know enough about them without getting granular, you see. And what I want to understand is um, instead of being focusing on the times, I want to be focusing on the eternities. So I want to actually be a man whose mind is fixed on the things above, as we are commanded to do. This is not a suggestion, set your mind in the things above, not in the things on earth. Um, but it's a, a command because when your heart is right and it's focusing on him, then the lure of the world begins to lose its pull. And you are now called to be a pilgrim in this world who will have an impact that will be incalculably diffusive. It'll touch the lives of others in ways you can't ever predict or imagine. It's an amazing thought. So you have this purpose. Now let me go back to contextualize um, the theme and purpose of this book again. This was Ezra doing, this was uh, Judas's, Judah's uh, religious restoration. He was really a priest, and so you have that side. Nehemiah focuses on the political and geographic mm -hmm. restoration, and uh, the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls are seen here, the political and, and the graph, geographic restoration. Uh, so he established a firm civil authority, and they worked together, Ezra and Nehemiah, for, this, for restoration. So having uh, be, built the, uh, the, te the, uh, the temple, then the walls. 
So there's a natural sequel, and that's why these two go together so well as, as they naturally do. But the purpose is to show the hand of God toward his people. And that's where we are as well, to see what is God at work, what's he doing in our times as well. What happened there, they accomplished in 52 days more than what had been done in 94 years beforehand because the walls were never really rebuilt. Obedient faith over, overcame opposition. And that's, what the, that's the theme that I'm going to be focusing on here. Now, I'm going to be doing something very odd for you. That um, You remember when you had a substitute uh, teacher um, in school? And what would the substitute teacher do? And you like the substitute teacher because um, they would never really teach, would they? They'd show a movie. Remember, they, they showed movies. Remember that? Am I wrong or right? I, I remember um, junior high, high school. We always liked it because we'd see a, a video. Usually they were cheesy and, and schmaltzy. Many from the, from the early 50s, it was painfully bad. But at least it was a video. So I'm going to give you a video. I found this wonderful thing, and it, is, it's, it's, it was created in Israel. It's, a, it's actually a Jewish organization that is really connecting us with the archaeology and the, the feeling of that time. So that's this production, and it's a 12-minute video. Good grief. But um, unprecedented, but it's that good. So are you ready for it? Okay. I hope you enjoyed that. It's, um, you know, you couldn't get the music track, apparently. We at least heard the audio track. So it, it worked as well as we might have hoped. So we're, we're throwing, that's the little video. The substitute is now gone and I'm back. <laughs> but this uh, City of David Institute for Jerusalem Studies is, is the, are the people who uh, produced this film. Did you find it to be helpful? It kind of put the story together rather well, I felt. You know, didn't it tie the threads together and gave you a reasonably good visual uh, sense of what it's like. And that's, uh, I think, very important to get a visual sense. In fact, um, when we're looking at this wall, then it's, it, just, it describes the sheep gate, the east gate, the horse gate, the water, uh, the fountain gate, the dung gate, the valley gate. Um, so we know what it was like, and uh, we have a pretty clear picture of what was involved in this. So it, again, it's a very historical uh, development. It's, so we're looking at um, how this happened, and we're looking at something that's not just theoretical. You saw the archaeological work that had been done, and some of the things that were uncovered, and the realization that we're dealing with space-time history, not just something vague, but it's something um, that is verifiable. And that's a good thing, because your faith is founded on fact, and that to me is, is most uh, incredibly important for us. I came across this um, article on Bible.org uh, by Stephen J. Cole that I'd like to take you through this on the next, uh, on chapter four, and he then continues in five and six. I found it to be exceedingly valuable and um, uh, appreciated his work on this. I, I have a lot of, I must have several hundred, if not more, um, resources of my own on Bible.org. Uh, so um, that's a nice little uh, website and so forth. But I sometimes go there, and I strongly recommend it to you. You're looking up a, you want to learn about a particular chapter of Scripture, um, just look it up, and it's amazing the resources they've got there. So that's good to do. But um, the this article, though, really tied it together as well as I've ever seen. So I wanted to walk you through these, these thoughts. Um, when Igor uh, Svorsky was 12, his parents told him that competent authorities had already proved human flight impossible. He went on to build the first helicopter in his, in his American plant. He posted this, uh, this sign. According to the recognized uh, aerotechnical test, the bumblebee can't fly because of the shape and weight of its body in relation to the total wing area. The bumblebee does not know this, so he go to, goes ahead and flies anyway. <laughs> so that's, 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 he doesn't know this. Um, the reality is, who told you that this can't be? Is it, what's, your, what's your source of authority? Is it, is it the one who is the infinite, eternal one who made all that is beautiful and true and good? Um, so it relates to what is your source of authority and is it verifiable? One of the themes that I find myself focusing on a good deal is that whole area. I'm posting articles on Christianity.com. And so one of the, so we've, we first of all went through the 12 basic objections 
against Christianity, you see. One of them, of course, is how do you know the Bible isn't full of contradictions and errors? So we took that whole chapter and uh, turned it into an article. So it, it really helps us in doing it that way. Let me just see. So here's uh, re, we, why we can trust the reliability of the Bible. So uh, we've been articleizing, to, to coin a term, articleizing my chapters. And I plan to do that with all my chapters of my books. Because making them, putting the cookies in a lower shelf, making them more available to give the synthesis of that whole. So it's got to be under 2,000 words. That's the key. So here's my overall teaching about the accuracy of the Bible. And you can see about um, the, uh, uh, what I just, the authority of the Bible and so forth. And uh, we'll go into more detail. So obviously, you can use the chapter a great deal more detail. But it's boiled it down in a, in a concise way, because these are questions that you know you're going to be encountering again and again. So does God exist? Why well, believe in miracles? Isn't this Christianity just a psychological crutch? And then the fourth one was, is the Bible reliable? Uh, the fifth one is, does God make sense in a world full of sufferings? That'll be the big one. But the interesting thing is the atheist who speaks about how could a good God allow that to happen has to appeal to a God, a good God, for it to happen. Because unless ultimate reality is moral, you can't morally condemn it. In other words, you, what's your category for morality? If you don't have an absolute for morality, then your idea is just your own opinion. So there's, it, it, they're defeated. And also, they have no answer to the problem of the injustice that they're describing because in their philosophy, people will literally get away forever with murder. But in the scriptures, no, they will not. Payday one day. And so the very God who actually makes this possible is the very God who tells us that he will vindicate and no one will get away because it's a moral universe. It's amazing stuff. All these things connect together. And so that's why we, it's, the more you focus on this worldview, the more you see God's given us a blueprint and a map for living and then other questions of this nature. But I call this to your attention because these are important things for us to wrestle with together, to say, is this true? And if it is true, then what are the implications for our lives? And that's so critical. Uh, at any rate, um, we're, we're looking at uh, this. Let me just go here. And what we see is a sequence, and I'm going to be going into this uh, in these, these three chapters. There's a series of, first of all, chapter three, though, before is an advance, and then, but then there's a setback. So they go to the city, and then there's a setback. Then there's an advance, then a setback. Another advance and setback in chapter four. Then another, in, 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 at the end of our chapter, then a setback in five. Advance, setback, advance, setback. So the, the Christian life is a conflict. You know this. This is not su surprising. There are going to be times um, of, of many opportunities and times of few opportunities. In fact, God wants us to forge the experiences, the wisdom we've gained in times of few opportunities when we're at the bottom. He wants us to use that so we have wisdom and perspective when there are times of many opportunities. You see, so you, you forge wisdom in those times and then there'll be a rhythm and you'll have things may open up. But use that wisdom that you've forged in that time. So it's a conflict. And even though it's God's will for you to go strong uh, in faith and to labor and to advance his kingdom, he doesn't remove the opposition. If you respond properly, the opposition will drive you to greater dependence on the Lord and to greater determination to do what he called you to do. And I think that's correct. So I think I couldn't put it better myself. I think that's exactly what we're looking at. So... The first defense against the enemy is to be aware of the kind of opposition that he uses. And he, he mentions six forms in this on our chapter. And so I'll just mention them very briefly. Uh, but let's take a quick look at the chapters. So here we have the work is ridiculed. So they uh, advance and then setback, advance, setback. And so they're mocking them and say, what are these feeble Jews doing? They're going to restore for themselves. Can they offer sacrifice? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? And so uh, to, they, these, these people who are actually mutually enemies, but they unite together against the Jews. And then the response of prayer, you see. And we're going to see how they respond in this opposition. They built the wall. It was joined together to half its height because the people had a mind to work. So there's a, an a advance, but then there's an opposition. They heard about that and they were enraged. And they conspired and so the discouragement then they used to overcome them. 
but then they have prayed to their God. So you see opposition response. And uh, the enemies then continued to pursue this and they will come up against us from every place and they stationed them in the lowest part. Don't be afraid of them, remember the Lord. So back and forth, you're gonna be seeing what we're, we're talking about. The enemies heard about this, that God had frustrated their plan. So we, we all returned to the wall. And then the, they would, then half the servants would have their work. Uh, with, half of them held the spears. And so there was a combination of both. And so there was a being a, a sense of a, a pre preparation and so that the, the, the whole concept then is an urgent warfare situation that we are in. So the first thing that we have is the anger of others against you. And so whenever you know Christ and attempt to accomplish things, the only thing I'd change here instead of accomplishing things for him, how would I change that? Allow him to do things through you. Don't stop doing things for Jesus. He won't be impressed. Uh, but instead, ask him to do things in you and through you. That's the only change I'd make in this. But it's an important, it's not a trivial matter. Uh, the anger of others against you, and so they become furious. Uh, the new work of God in Jerusalem threatened their lifestyle, and they got furious. And Satan's aim was to get the new believer to get cool as contentment to the commitment to the Lord. So whenever you see opposition, then you know that's going to be one of the forms it's going to be. Uh, those who are opposed to you, they hear about your faith, Mockery and sarcasm is another force uh, that they can use. And so who do they think they are? They're gonna achieve projects of thanksgiving in this short time? So there's the ridicule. And so again, Satan frequently uses ridicule against those who take a stand for the Lord. I mean, the, the fact is, if he's serious, and so this idea of when you take a stand for the Lord, the enemy will notice and you become a, a target for opposition, threats and intimidation. So yet another, if, if anger and ridicule don't work, they become more aggressive. And so there was more now threats of violence when they, that, they, that they circulated among them and uh, some bands of terrorists. So again, there was a terrorist activity, immense psychological pressure that, that would put them under. And that's going to be another come. So it's not just external, internal as well so that can they break down their faith, their hope, their trust. So there's intimidation uh, that, that takes place again and again. Um, encouragement and exhaustion is yet another one, a, a discouragement rather. So that the, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there is much rubbish and we ourselves are unable to build the wall. They get, after a while you get weary. But first you have this first blush of collective enthusiasm, don't you? Then the project, then you get down to the nitty gritty and it's not so good. How do you retain that enthusiasm as time goes by? So it's a challenge we know, we've all experienced things of this sort. And there's a cycle, isn't there, in, in a work context. There's this kind of a cycle where we see these things and, and have different perspectives uh, on, on these things. I came across this cartoon about a really hard thing. And a really hard thing is interesting because you see a really hard thing is like this, uh, how it feels right now. You see, what happens, how it will feel in a few months. And then how it's gonna feel in a few years. What you need to do is to get the long-term perspective and the wisdom literature always invites us to take the long view, not the short view. It would appear in, in the short run that the enemies are gaining uh, territory. But in the long run, we are part of a journey. You're running a marathon, not a, not a sprint. And then, then we have to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith. We have to continue to hope. And we have to have this perspective that it's really not going to be something that's going to last forever. So again, it's a mindset you want to have when times of dis discouragement uh, and depression might come in. Um, right in the middle of, the, of things then is when uh, we're almost there, let's get it done. And it's a kind of a mindset then you can have of a loss of, of, of hope that you, can, that you feel like quitting. And your weariness leads you to discouragement. Um, that can be a real problem as well. So we know this. These are things that we see in this text and it's a very clear reality. In um, the criticism and mockery from the enemy without, um, 
But then this came from the Jews who lived uh, near the enemy. So in verse uh, uh, 12 then, so in, in verses 3, you had these, uh, this criticism and mockery. But then beginning in verse 12, some from farther uh, around began to hear. When the Jews who lived near them, so it began to, the opposition continued to mount. And it was a larger uh, force against them than had been there before. So what will happen then is that um, this negativity, which is an enemy of faith, what was their mindset when they went to the... Um, to the land, and they, remember they sent out the 12 spies at Kadesh Barnea. What was the response of 10 of the spies? We can't do it. We can't do it. What, is, what was the metaphor they used? Yeah, they're like, we're, they're giants in the land, you see? And we are like grasshoppers in their sight, you see? Boy, with that mindset, that's a real overcomer, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so it's natural then. So negativism is the enemy of faith. You see, they're fixing their eyes on the wrong object. And so the real thing that's needful then is to turn to God in these times. And you're going to see this theme recurring again and again, that in spite of these obstacles, what do they do? What resources do they use? And, and another one besides negativism is the, the obstacle of fear. So that the people had... Uh, uh, seen this this cumulative effect of all the uh, fear fact of the factors in verse 14 then describes it in this way then uh, when I saw their fear I rose and spoke to the nobles the officials and the rest of the people do not be afraid of them and he says remember this is critical you need to on a daily basis remember let me take stock take inventory every day where did I come from who am I why am I here? Where am I going? Where'd you come from? You, you came forth from God and you're going to go back to God. That's where you're going. And who are you? That's your identity. Are you defined by the world or by the word? And you know the obvious dif distinction. If you're defined by God and by the, in the word, even though it's contrary to your feelings and expectations, to the contrary, you choose to believe that and you become more and more secure, more and more significant, more and more satisfied. And as a consequence, the more you are, the more confident you are, the more you're able to, in fact, be so secure you can serve others without even responding, ex expecting reciprocity. So these things, taking stock, taking inventory, I encourage you to do that on a regular basis. It's one of the reasons why I ask those three questions throughout the course of the day. You know they are what they are. So those first, those, those three questions of Jesus, the first and the last, and the one in the middle there, who do you, what do you seek? What do you want today? What am I looking for? What's my value? And then who do you say I am? How, who am I to you today? And then do you love me more than these? There's always going to be oppositions. There's always going to be idols for destruction that they're going to constantly pull you down and tether you to the visible and the, and the now. But we're called to pursue the uh, invisible and the unseen. Uh, the uh, not yet rather. So when we see this, then you have to fix your eyes back on Jesus. And there's a constant exercise, you see, of, of, of growth, of, of steadiness. And so there's this line from T.S. Eliot in East Coker, uh, the uh, conclusion when he says, we must, uh, old men ought to be explorers. I love that, that phrase. That's why I have this podcast with Stuart McAllister. Old men ought to be explorers. We must be still and still moving. Interesting, brilliant statement. Still means that you are contemplative. You are rooted and grounded in, 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 in the depth of, of, the, of the word. And so you have an interior life that's solid and stable. And those are the roots, systems, that will sustain you during the storms of life when the tree is buffeted by the winds and the storms so that you, you send roots downward and you bear fruit upward. And so as we see then... We are called then to <clears throat> see they, they both go together because still and still moving. You're not just going to be doing nothing. You're not just going to be in um, uh, a monastery, but rather you're going to be in the, in the marketplace. And in this context, then, you are a contemplative in action, still moving. And you continue in this world. And you continue to grow and you continue to go into, a fur, into another union, a further communion, into a deeper intensity, as he describes it. So if anything, 
we ought to be explorers. As we get older, we should become sages. We should become and people who get, gain the second naivete, who have a sense of childlike wonder and awe that they're immersed in something that's so vast, so great, that they can't even begin to fathom all that it means, but they know that they are beloved, that they, who they are, where they came from, where, they, where they're going. So God gives us that narrative. We're embedded in mystery in this world, and yet at the same time, he has given us a vision for where we're to go. So remember the Lord, and, and then you have a perspective how they, the two go hand in hand. And then um, what do we do with this opposition? Well, prayer, work, vigilance, and focus on the Lord are the four responses. So we've, they lifted their voices in prayer as the first response in chapter 4, verse 4, and in verse 9. And so this is critical for us to see. Again, go back to verse 4, and that you'll see, Hear, O our God how we are despised. We turn the reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in the land of captivity. And then in verse 9, we, but we prayed to the Lord our God. Because of them, we set up a guard against them. You notice the divine sovereignty, human responsibility, um, so that you, you have this balanced uh, perspective here, that you have a combination. Um, and he's inviting us then to go and to pursue this in prayer. It seems like a vindictive prayer, but it's a prayer not for personal vengeance, but rather a prayer that God would judge sinners. And he's looking at it from that divine standpoint, that ultimately they were hindering God's work, and it was a prayer that God would judge those who oppose his kingdom and glory. And to pray for God's kingdom is established implicitly, not explicitly, to pray for all competing kingdoms to be destroyed. So there's that component of it. Um, so it's tethered, and, and it's, it's nuanced, though, because we can pray for our enemies. That's a lovely thing about this. He calls us to love our enemies because it's possible for you in the agape of Christ to seek the highest good of, of, of the object loved, even though you don't like them. Isn't that nice that he didn't teach it, tell us like one another as I've liked you? There's a lot of people I don't like, frankly. I won't say. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was the first question. <laughs> Would you have chosen your relatives? I'm mean, let's be honest about this. They're not people you choose to be your friends in most cases. And Storge, the, that love of affection is the humblest of the loves because it doesn't choose the object at all. But the point is that there are a lot of people, I thank God I don't have to like them, but I can love them. What I mean by that is I can intend their highest good in spite of themselves. And what is their highest good if they're not a believer? It's to come to faith in Jesus. If, if they are a believer, it's to come, become like Jesus. And that would deal with the thing I don't like in them. You see, because if they then surrendered and became like him, the more lovable they would become. And that's the interesting thing. We who are unlovable can become lovable, lovely, because we express, we're conduits, we're agents, we're vessels for the indwelling Christ, which is an astonishing thought. That the, in, that the infinite word becomes the incarnate word so it can become the indwelling word. Who would have guessed that he is in you? That you are actually in him and he is in you. Think of the implications of that. If you're in him and he's, but he's the one who made and holds the worlds together. So you are inhabited and indwelled by infinity and eternity. And yet at the same time, he is boundlessly beyond you. So he's both near and far. It's these deep mysteries that hold this together. Um, so we see that we have this huge indwelling power, the power of the resurrected Christ indwelling us. So this is, uh, then they put their hearts to the, to the work. And you see, this is very, very critical. Um, they, um, they, they had a mind to work. Though there was a slight pause while they organized the militia, they didn't abandon the work or ch or ch and to chase down the enemy. So never get so distracted by fight, fighting false teachers that we forget our main purpose. Yes, the elders were to protect them against false teaching, but you want to, the way you deal with false teaching is not to do the false teaching, is but to show them the truth. So you, you teach them what a real bill looks like by teaching them to re, understand the real article, not the counterfeit. Then when you know the real bill so well, you'll deter, detect the counterfeit you'll, it, because there's so many different ways you can counterfeit it. So don't get so focused on that. Um, both the sword and the trowel are necessary, but the reason for the sword is so that we can use the trowel. That phrase, trust God and keep your powder dry, 
You say that's the uh, keeping your eyes on the enemies in vigilance. So at the same time, they trusted God, but they also were vigilant, weren't they? So you have a wonderful balance of divine sovereignty and human responsibility, that they understand that they are to be trusting in God, but it doesn't mean they're to be passive, let go and let God, but rather they are, in fact, inviting him to use them and to encourage them and to give them the, the capacity for vigilance. They didn't take their clothes off at night so that they would be ready to defend the city. This was not an easy time. It was an all or nothing effort. And so um, we, we, we realize that we're often oblivious to the dangers that come from our adversary, the devil, who seeks to devour us, and we don't use the full armor of God. Uh, so this is uh, the, the danger here. We need a network of brothers and sisters in the Lord with whom we can rally to when the enemy attacks, because it's going to happen more and more. We're going to need each other more, uh, not less. And it's very going to be very critical. And then finally, they kept their minds focused on the Lord. Remember this wonderful text in verse 14, because it's, it's so, um, so critical for us to see. Um, he says, um, am I in verse 14? Yes, do not be afraid. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. So be dependent upon him while you, in fact, engage in this warfare. It's not a passivity. It's to be vigilant and to remember him in your life. So when opposition hits, it's easy to get your focus off the Lord and onto your problems. That's why we're to set our mind on the things above and realize that, that, that no temptation has overtaken you, but it's such as is common to man. And God is faithful Will not, uh, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, that you may be able to endure it. So keep your mind focused on the Lord. It's an interesting thing that uh, is cited about uh, um, Will Durant. Rome remained great as long as she had enemies who forced her to unity, vision, and heroism. When she'd overcome all her enemies, she flourished for a moment and then began to die. Opposition is what kept Rome strong. So respond as Nehemiah did then with um, prayer, keeping on the work, vigilance against the enemy, and keeping the focus of your heart, grace on the great and awesome God whom we serve. It's a nice combination, isn't it? So that's uh, a good takeaway for us. Um, we have a few minutes, do we? Uh, or do, uh, a couple of minutes. Two minutes.